Before I get started today, I think it would be appropriate uh, for us to have prayer and um, make sure that we are praying for our country. I know that uh, there, probably most of you are aware, last night there was an assassination attempt on former President uh, Donald Trump. Now, let me, let me say this. Sometimes we get caught up in the political rather than the biblical, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with having political opinions or stances. You should vote, okay? You should vote your conscience. And hopefully, you vote in a manner that is biblical. In other words, you vote for uh, biblical principles, biblical, biblical values, but it doesn't matter if you agree politically with whoever is the leader, whoever is in uh, leadership positions. You say, how do you get that? Because the Bible tells us that we are to pray for the king. Now, when that was written, by the way, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, okay, Holy Scripture, the Apostle Paul wrote it, he said, pray for the king. Do you know who the king was? Nero. Nero, when he wrote that, and it said about Nero that he lit the streets of Rome with the bodies of burning Christians. He burned them alive. Now, I can say with all confidence, uh, we've not gotten to that point, okay? You may not agree with everything politically, but uh, we're not being burned at the stake. We're not being thrown into prison, yeah, maybe, <laughs> all right. Um, but the point is you still have freedoms and you still have a responsibility, no matter what, to pray for the leadership of our nation. That's God's word, okay? Once again, taking the politics out of it, you say, well, I don't agree with so-and-so or I don't believe this should be right. I, I get it, okay? I certainly also have political positions. But our responsibility to God is to pray for our nation. We're to pray for people to follow the Lord. That's our responsibility. And so I want us, as we begin today, to pray for our nation. Pray for those that are involved in all this process, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the day. Pray for our people and our country. Lord, most of all, we pray that you would help our people to turn to you. I pray that there would be a great revival of people turning to Jesus Christ for salvation, for hope. And God, I pray that you'd just pour out your spirit, your presence on our people. And then, Lord, I pray for our political leaders. Lord, I, I pray for uh, President Biden. You commanded we're to pray whether we believe in what they're doing or not. Lord, it seems that he's having some real cognitive issues, some health issues, God, I pray that you'd be with him. I pray that you'd help his family to trust in you, to follow you. Uh, Lord, I pray for former President Donald Trump. That assassination attempt on his life was unconscionable, uh, has no place in our society, has no place in our culture. And Lord, I pray that you'd help him to recover. I pray that you'd help his family. And Lord, once again, help them to turn to you fully. Help them to believe the word of God. God, I pray that you'd just uh, be with all the political leaders, our governors, our local politicians, our senators, our Congress representatives, our local politicians and mayors and uh, county commissioners and uh, school board uh, seats. Lord, in every one, I pray that you'd help, first of all, everyone to turn to you, to turn to you in faith, to follow the Word of God, to follow the principles of the Word of God. And I pray that you comfort our people, bless our people, help us to see that our hope comes from you, not who's president, not who leads a particular political party. And God, I pray that you help the rhetoric to calm down so that our people can actually love one another, that we can actually... Uh, be a blessing to each other, even if we don't agree. And, and Lord, I pray that you'd help us as Christians to embody that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Well, today I'm going to talk about something that I think is very appropriate for where we are uh, in our culture today, particularly in the news in the last 24 hours, and here it is. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. I had a conversation with someone right before the service started, and he was telling me, he said, when I was young, uh, these preachers would say, Jesus is coming soon. And he said, I believe that it's true, that Jesus is coming soon. And I agree. I don't know when. Uh, could it be a while? Sure. Could it be today? Sure. And I'm going to show you, I'm just going to, it's going to be a very simple message, and we're going to talk about what and who and when, and we're going to give a warning, okay? Uh, here's what it says in the last two verses of the book of Revelation, the last two verses of the Bible. It says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. So when you say Jesus is coming soon, he himself said that, okay? That's recorded uh, for us over 1,900 years ago, nearly 2,000 years ago. I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then he ends with this. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen means so be it. And so uh, he is showing us that the return of Christ, number one, is imminent. That means it's soon. It could happen at any time. But it's also a blessing. Uh, the grace of our Lord will be fulfilled to its height when Jesus comes again. Why? Because when Jesus comes again, he is going to judge the nations. He's going to judge the world. He's going to judge unrighteousness. And we will begin eternity with him. We'll have a resurrected body that will go throughout all of eternity with no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more getting fat when you eat banana pudding. I mean, it's just going to be a blessing. It's going to be a blessing, okay? And so the grace of our Lord is evident because Jesus not only saves us, but he's coming to get us. He's coming again. So today, I want to jump right into this, and I just want to have a couple questions uh, about who is for when it's going to happen, what it is. So we'll begin reading in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 24. Uh, and this is uh, Jesus speaking. He said, but in those days, talking about the last days, the days when Jesus comes again, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the heaven and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. And then... They will see the Son of Man. Now, if you don't know who that is, the Son of Man was a title given in the book of Daniel to the Messiah, the Christ. And that's who Jesus is. He said, you're going to see me, the Son of Man, coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Who are the elect? Those are ones that are chosen before the foundation of the world to be followers of Jesus. Uh, if you're saved, you're part of the elect. Okay? If you're not saved, get saved, and you'll be a part of the elect. If you're not saved, and you never get saved, you're not part of the elect. All right? Does that make sense? I heard one uh, 19th century preacher say it this way. He said, God votes for you, the devil votes against you, and you get to cast the deciding vote. Now, I don't know if I agree with that completely, but here's what I do know. Um, if you want to be a part of the elect, turn to Christ in faith and receive him. That way you know that you are and that Jesus will come for you. He says he's going to gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth uh, to the ends of heaven. In other words, everybody from all time that has been a respondent in faith that has received Christ, that has turned their life to him, he said, throughout the ends of the earth, the ends of heaven, from the four winds, I'm going to gather you to myself. And then he said, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. Jesus had given 
a lesson about a fig tree. He says, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, once again, Jesus is giving this story. It is designed to help us see that there are things that are happening that will help us understand that Jesus' return is near. I believe, personally, he's talking about uh, when the state of Israel became a state again, and uh, that this fig tree is budding, and when you see that happening, it's getting close. That's what he's saying, okay? So when you see these things taking place, you know the end is near. At the very gates, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That should bring you great comfort. God's word abides forever. Everything you see around you will pass away. And we know that's true, right? I mean, the fact is, your house is not going to live forever. Your car is not going to abide forever. You yourself are not in this physical, natural body, the state that you're in right now, going to live forever. We all know that. Things pass away. We're all here temporarily. I am the pastor of this church temporarily. You say, wait, are you planning on leaving? No, but one day I'm going to die, okay? Or maybe before I die, maybe I don't have enough marbles to be the pastor of this church anymore, okay? Uh, God knows pastor of church tests your marbles, all right? So, but here's what I know. I am here temporarily, and so are you. If you're the owner of a business, it's just temporary. If you're the CEO of a company, it's just temporary. If you're a mother or father or grandfather or grandmother, it's just temporary. No matter what it is, maybe you have a big bank account. If you do see me after the service, all right, so. <laughs> but no, it's temporary. Because you know what? And I've been a pastor for a long time now. I have seen, I have no idea how many funerals I've done or been to, a lot. You know what I've never seen? I've never seen a U-Haul connected to the back of a hearse filled with stuff. Why is that? Because you can't take it with you. You don't take it with you. Now, can you send some things ahead? I believe you can. The good deeds, the good works, the, uh, the investment in the kingdom of God, the generosity. I believe you receive blessings for that and receive rewards for that. But guess what? You can have a billion dollars in your bank account and you don't get to take a single penny of it with you. Now, you're going to have some heirs and some people that are going to argue over it after you die. They're going to get angry. They're going to get mad over it, okay? But you don't get to take it with you. And there's something pure about that. There's something that's a blessing about that. You say, well, how so? Because it tells us that we only have a short time. And that what we do now matters. Listen. Listen. How you live, what you do, the decisions you make, it matters. It matters. Well, anyway, he says, uh, this generation won't pass away uh, until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day, the return of Christ, or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So, here's what I can say. In my years of serving God, in my years of being in the church, I have seen, on television mostly, some in books, of people that predict that Jesus is going to come by this particular date. And here's what I know for certain. He ain't coming on that date, whatever they say. <laughs> you know Why? Because the Bible tells us no one knows the day or the hour. I mean, and there, once again, there's something beautiful about that. Why? 
Because it tells us that his coming could be at any time. And therefore, we must live like he's coming today. Now, here's the question. If you knew he was coming this afternoon, what would you do? Would you, would you be generous? Would you forgive someone that you've had bitterness in your heart toward? Would you try to reconcile a relationship? Would you try to share Jesus and win someone to Christ that you love? What would you do if you knew Jesus would come today? Well, the beauty of this is it challenges us to live just like Jesus could come today. Why? Because he could. He may. I don't know. Um, he says, so be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the, matter, the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or in the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Do you get the idea Jesus wants us to stay awake? I mean, he said it over and over and over again. Why? Because he wants us to understand how important this is, how much of a blessing this really is to our lives. So I've got some questions I want to answer. They're one-word questions. You can take notes, or you can go on the Bible app and follow it, or you can go on the Church Center app, and you can look at these notes. I hope you will. Uh, you can look at them during the week again and remember and reflect uh, during the week. Be a blessing to you. But there's really four things I want you to write down. Only four simple words. And the first word is what? Question mark. What? What is the second coming of Christ? What does that mean? Well, let me read to you some scripture that hopefully will help you understand what that is. Jesus is coming again. That's what he's promised. And in the Old Testament, that day, when it says that day, is referring to the end of the world, okay? Also known as the day of judgment, when God will judge the nations, the world, and all non-believers. So the idea of that day was the day that Jesus would return and that judgment would come, that justice would come on the earth. Let me ask you a question. Are you looking forward to a day when justice comes? I know I am. There's a lot of injustice in this world. Um, when I think of people that traffic women for the sex slave industry or children, when I think of people that murder and rape, when I think of people, even political leaders, that uh, take advantage of people, that use and abuse people, we see that and we know in our heart, that's not right. And you should have righteous indignation for that. But here's what I know. There's coming a day when they're going to be held accountable. There's coming a day of justice. Thank God. And, and so when we read in the Old Testament about that day, I want you, I want you to see that uh, it is dealing with God's righteous judgment at the end of time. Zephaniah, that's one of those books that most of you probably don't, you couldn't find uh, in the Old Testament. Um, but Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, it says, The terrible day of the Lord is near. What he's talking about is the day that Jesus comes again. That's not going to be a terrible day if you're a believer. It's going to be a wonderful day. But if you've refused Christ, if you're not a follower of his, it's going to be a terrible day of judgment. It's going to be awful. 
He said, swiftly it comes, a day of bitter tears, a day when even strong men will cry out. It will be a day when the Lord's anger is poured out, a day of terrible distress and anguish, a day of ruin and desolation. By the way, let me just pause right here. Uh, you say, well, that sounds horrible. It is. But you know what? You don't have to go through that. You do not have to experience that. Because if you follow Christ, if you turn your life to Him, guess what? You're not going to be in on that. Isn't that good news? That makes it not a terrible day for you, but a wonderful day for you. He says that it will be a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet calls and battle cries. Down go the walled cities and the strongest battlements. You get the, the idea that in that day of judgment at the end of time, which, by the way, we all want. We don't want it for ourselves, but we want justice to come. Are you sick and tired of seeing people take advantage of the disadvantaged? I know I am. It, it makes my blood boil. Are you sick and tired of seeing people abuse others? There's coming a day of righteous judgment, a day when it will be set right, and we can take comfort in knowing that. So uh, when he says, what is going to happen, the return of Christ? Well, in the Old Testament, this is what it talks about, okay? That day when Christ comes, and it will be a day of judgment on the earth. But uh, in the New Testament, it changes the verbiage a little bit. And in the New Testament, this is known as what we call the great white throne judgment. That's the day when God will judge the nations and sinners and those that have rejected him. Listen to Revelation 20, verses 11 to 14. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence. Once again, there's that fear, that terror at the idea of being judged. But they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. By the way, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't buy a moment of heaven. You know that? You can't buy justice. You can't buy forgiveness. Oh, but you can receive it freely. You can receive it as a gift from God. And he gives it out to anyone. Anyone. Isn't that good news? You say, well, I've been pretty bad in the past. It's for you. You say, well, I've been a pretty good person all my life. It's for you. It's for all of us that want to respond to it. He says, the earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, I want to point out a very clear distinction between believers and non-believers, between the righteous, those that have been given the righteousness of Jesus through faith, and those that have not received that. I want you to notice, maybe you didn't catch it, what are they going to be judged for? The things they did. Their works. What am I going to be judged for when I stand before God? Not for the things I did. You know why? Because the things I did are not righteous. You know what I'm going to be judged for? Whether or not Jesus' righteousness has been given to me. And when I have been given the righteousness of God through faith, you know what happens? When I stand before God... You know, and I used to think that my life was going to be like this giant movie. And when I stood before God, you ever think this? I don't know where I got this from. But that my life would be played before all to see. And the things that I did in secret that I didn't want anybody to know. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, such a weird, twisted mind. I even thought that when I was taking a shower that that was going to be shown. I don't know why I thought that. I was going to be naked before the entire world to see. Uh, throughout all human history. But God's not making a movie. But you know what he is doing? He's making a record. 
He's got some books. And you know, the primary one you should worry about is your name in the book of life. You say, how do I know if my name is there? All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is receive. You say, well, if I receive Christ by faith, what does that mean? It means you're a part of the elect. It means that God chose you before the foundation of the world. He knew that you were going to be saved. He knew who you were. He, he knows your name before you were ever born. The Bible says in Psalms that he saw you when you were being knit together in your mother's womb. God knew you. Isn't that good news? Sometimes we don't feel like God knows us. We don't feel like God sees us. We say silly things like, well, he's so busy running the world, he doesn't have time to listen to my prayer. You know, that's not biblical. And it's also not a big picture of who God is. Because let me tell you something. If he can, with a word, we are a logos-based universe, a word-based universe. And it has been discovered scientifically that the longest, most complex word and language in human history, you know what it is? It's DNA. Millions of letters long. And you know what God did? Read Genesis 1. This will help you. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's a logos, a word-based universe. And John, uh, John said in the Gospel of John, the very first words, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And you know what it says about Him? That He has given us the right to become sons of God. He's given us that right. Why? Because we were good? No. No. But because you have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is how you get saved. Not by being good. Not by joining the church. Not by giving money. Not by getting baptized even. It is about uh, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. When you can do that, the return of Christ is going to be a blessing. Now, when I was a teenager, I was a Christian. I'd gotten saved when I was eight. And I remember feeling, and some of you may have experienced this, Jesus, please don't come back till I get married. And, and if I'm being totally transparent and honest, if I'm being totally transparent and honest, it's because I, I wanted to have sex a lot, okay? That's the reason, okay? I was like, God, don't come back till I get to experience that, okay? <laughs> you know, as a 13 or 14-year-old boy, I was like, you know, I, I, I want to get in on that, all right? Well, um, there is no good reason for Jesus to delay his coming. Okay, no matter if you're like, well, I, I think I might win the lottery. Do you know what heaven's going to be like? Do you realize that in heaven, the very thing that we covet the most, money, gold, you know what they use gold for in heaven? Pavement. That's how little esteemed God sees wealth. Why? Because he owns everything. And I love this in the Old Testament. He said, if I was hungry, you think I'd tell you? If I had a need, you think I'd tell you? He said, no, because I own everything. Aren't you glad that a better day is coming? He said, and the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books, and the sea gave up its dead and death, and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds, and then death and the grave uh, were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So what? We're talking about the return of Christ, the end of time, uh, the judgment of the world. But I want to just give you a little bit of comfort. If you're a believer, you won't be in the great white throne judgment. There's a different judgment, 
And I want you to see it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And the Apostle Paul wrote about it. 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due. Due. For what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So once again, you're not judged according to your works. But guess what? Your, ju- your works are judged to see whether they were for lasting value or not. And, and this is something that we need to think about. That um, there's going to be a reward. But it's either going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. Or it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble that will not pass the test. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. This is the Apostle Paul. As someone else is building on it, he laid the foundation of the gospel. So let each one take care how he builds upon the foundation. That's a stern warning to us. Be careful the kind of life that you're building. Okay, once again, he's not suggesting that you're earning your way to heaven, that you're going to heaven because you've been good. He's saying you're building something. Take care to make sure you're building something that's right. He said, uh, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you get the picture? If you're not building a life on Christ, you're wasting your life. That's what he's saying. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day. That's a capital D. That's the return of Christ. The day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. You say, what is that fire? I don't know. I think it might be the eyes of the Lord uh, the, uh, the purity, the fact that everything, as this metaphor suggests, that is not lasting and valuable and right, it'll be burned up. So in other words, when you stand before God, and here's the great question, am I going to have to present to God, when I stand before Him, am I going to say, Lord, look at my beautiful house. Lord, you may notice that I drive these fine cars. Lord, you may not know this. I also had a vacation home on the beach. Not only that, Lord, I've got this gorgeous boat. Now listen, I'm certainly not against a beautiful home. Certainly not against nice cars. Not against having a vacation home, if you can afford it. I'm not against having a full bank account. But listen, if that's what you have to present when you stand before God, you know what he's going to do? It's going to be burned up. You know why? Because it doesn't last. It's wood, hay, and stubble. It's temporary in nature. And that's his point. That if your life is not filled with things that are eternal in value, then you're going to suffer loss when you stand before God. You're not going to go to hell, but you're going to suffer loss. Now, now think about that. Are you living a life that when you stand before God, you're going to present to Him things that are eternal in value? Look, the thing I think that is the most valuable in eternity is another person, a soul. Uh, Are you reaching people with the good news of the gospel? Uh, What about your kids? What about your grandkids? What about your neighbors? Are you reaching people that need Jesus? In my opinion, that's the most valuable thing. Jesus said, Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Not a little. You say, Well, I'm not Billy Graham. Of course you're not. But you don't have to have... uh, the skills or the platform of Billy Graham in order to influence people with the gospel. Because you have kids. If you're a child in school, you have schoolmates. You have kids you play with in your neighborhood. Um, If you're a mother, 
you got kids. If you're a grandmother, you got grandkids. If you're a father or grandfather, you've got people to influence. If you have a job, you've got people that you work with that need Jesus. If you live in a neighborhood or an apartment complex, you got a lot of people that need Jesus, especially if they're on the HOA, okay? They need Jesus bad. Do you know what he's saying? That when Jesus comes, are you going to be awake? Are you going to have something other than wood, hay, or stubble? Are you going to have something that is of eternal value? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? He says, um, if anyone has built on the foundation uh, and survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved only as through fire. Now, he's not suggesting that you earn your salvation, you get saved because you're good. He's just saying that there are going to be people that do go to heaven. They are followers of Jesus, but when they stand there, they've got nothing of value. Let me ask you a question. If you know that this life is temporary. Let's say you live to be 100 years old. That's unusual. But there are people that do live 100 years. Let me ask you, what if you live 100 to 100? People ask me, do you want to live to 100? No, I do not. I mean, if I could be strong and didn't have to wear a diaper and, uh, you know, the highlight of my week was not being pushed in my wheelchair to the Golden Corral, okay, uh, if I was able to have all my marbles, okay, and, and get around, I, I, yeah, that'd be great, okay? But I doubt that's going to be me. Um, I doubt that I'm going to get that long. But let, let me just say I did. Do you know how much of a grain of sand on the seashore that is compared to eternity? Do you know how much a drop in a bucket of water that is compared to eternity? So why, why would I build everything in my life for the temporary? Your career, important, don't get me wrong. God blessed you with it, but it's temporary. I don't care how much money you make, you can be Elon Musk. Let me, let me say this, do you know that Elon Musk one day is going to die? And he's not taking a single penny with him, okay? Um, let's say that you put all your effort, all your energy into that. Well, you know what Jesus said? And he didn't say it in these words, but he said, that's a waste. How silly. How, how can you do that? That's what he's saying. He wants us to understand that um, there is a time that eternity will matter. Eternity will matter. Well, the New Testament refers to the day of the Lord as the day when Christ comes again. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So when Jesus comes again, it's going to be a surprise. You don't... We should expect it, but it, you won't know. Philippians 2.16, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I would be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. You get the picture? It matters. There's coming a day that all this is going to be over. And once again, I hope you live a long time. But it's nothing compared to eternity. So that's the what. You say, oh my goodness, it's time to leave. And you've only gotten one of four questions answered. Well, the other three are very, very quick, okay? <laughs> the question is next, who? What is it? It's the return of Christ. Who is it for? Well, Jesus will return for the saved, for you. He says, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Good news. 
If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when he returns again, he's not going to forget you. Isn't that good news? Hey, when I, was, when I was just a kid, probably 10, 11 years old, I'd been saved at age 8, but we watched, I watched this movie, a Christian movie, called The Burning Hell. And it was one of the most, as far as production values and acting and all that stuff, it was one of the worst movies ever made. It was awful, okay? But it scared, literally, the hell out of me. You said, why would you say that? Because The Burning Hell was about these guys that one of them died and he went to hell, and the whole movie was about showing about his experience in hell. And I was like, oh, I was terrified of that. And look, I was, um, I was so scared. And it affected me emotionally so much that I, have you ever done this? Every night before I went to bed, I prayed, Lord, just in case I'm not saved, I want you to save me today. <laughs> Literally every night for a long time. And then there were several times that I awakened in the middle of the night. And I couldn't hear any activity in the house. And you know what my thought was? Oh, no. Jesus came back and I got left behind. <laughs> and I, more than one time, I would lean over the banister, my bedroom was upstairs, and I'd say, Mama! Daddy! And they, I'd wake them up in the middle of the night and say, What? And I was like, oh, I'm so relieved. And I said, I'm just making sure that Jesus didn't come and I was left behind. All right. <laughs> now, it should bring comfort to you that he's not going to leave you behind. If you're a follower, so who? It's for you. It's for believers. When? Well, we don't know. He said, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. So when you see some guy trying to sell you a book, or get you to sign up for his podcast that costs money. And he's telling you when Jesus is coming again, save your money. Because he doesn't know. You say, how do you know that? Because I trust Jesus' words more than his. Amen. Pretty simple, right? So, what I'm saying is this. When is he coming? Could be today. I hope it is. Could be a hundred years from now. Could be longer. I don't know. You don't know either. You say, well, the Bible says that we're in the last days. It does. And we have been in the last days ever since the resurrection of Jesus. No, I'm serious. Okay. That is what signaled the last days. The apostles talked about that they were living in the last days. Uh, the, writer, the authors of all the New Testament books thought they were living in the last days. John, when he wrote the book of Revelation, uh, probably the last book that was written in Holy Scripture, he said we're in the last days. So we've been in the last days for almost 2,000 years. Are we in the last days? Yes. Is today the last day? I don't know. Is it going, are we going to see Jesus come back in the next year? I hope so. Do you know for sure? No. Do you know for sure? No. Does anybody know for sure? Yeah, the Heavenly Father. He knows. And guess what? He's never early and he's never late. He is always right on Time. We've got an on-time God. Amen, church. An on-time God. Well, what is the warning? He said, be on guard. Stay awake. Stay awake. Stay alert. Be aware. So that's the warning. So why do I have joy? Because Jesus is coming again. Why do I have hope? Because Jesus has given me hope, and he's coming again. Why do I know that everything's going to be okay, no matter who gets elected, no matter who runs the country? How do I know it's going to be okay? Because one day, King Jesus is coming again. You know, let me, tell you, let me just let you know, uh, whether you vote for Biden or whether you vote for Trump, it doesn't really matter 
What matters is that one day King Jesus is going to be on the throne. Isn't that good news? I am looking forward to the day when we have neither Republicans nor Democrats nor Independents, but King Jesus. And that should give you hope. Heavenly Father, help us to follow you, to uh, follow you in hope. And Lord, we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me encourage you that if you have not received Christ, I've talked about this during this message. Why don't you say something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. And I'm asking you not only to forgive me, but to save me. Come in my life. Change me forever. I'm giving myself surrendering myself to you. If you'll do that, fill out that card. Um, you say, well, I don't have time to fill it out and put it in the offering. Well, drop it in the drop box on the way out. Or bring it to me. Or bring it to somebody at the prayer team up here by this table. Um, and so you can use that to communicate with us in any way. Ushers, would you come? Uh, we're going to take our offering at this time. Now, how can you give? What are the ways that you can give? Well, there are four or five primary ways, and you go ahead and pass that as you uh, get here. Um, you can give in this bucket as it is passed, and that's old school, and I like old school, um, but if you don't carry around a checkbook or cash, I carry around neither. I don't even know if I have any cash on me. In fact, I think I do. I've got like three bucks. And for some reason, they're in my wallet. And they haven't been there super long. And they won't be there super long. And then after that, I'm probably not going to have any cash in my wallet for a long time. Why? Because I use debit cards. And I use the phone. And I, I, I use modern conveniences. So you can give cash or check. You can mail that in. Or... You can give on the internet at stillwaters.online. You can give that way. Very convenient way to give. Or you can text. This is great. 84321. You can text that number. It'll set it up. And then whenever you want to give again, you just hit that text and put the amount in. And it's very easy. The simplest and easiest and most convenient way to give is to get the Church Center app. You say, well, I don't have that. I'd like to know about that. There's kind of an aqua-colored card in the rack on the way out on your right. You can grab that. It'll tell you how to download that app. Um, and for those of you that have it, you know how convenient that is. It keeps up with your giving. You can follow along with sermon notes. You can get announcements. You can get all kinds of stuff that you need that will be convenient for you on that app. And uh, it is the simplest and quickest and best way to give. And so, anyway, uh, that's how you can do it. I love you guys. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm so glad that you uh, came and so glad you put up with my ranting and raving. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week.